Um, titulare Origins of Cell Biology and Descrivi uh, Laboratorio de Porter e Pallade, Kifoi Pies or Umidos Pies. And as the activity era entry quarenta cinco and sesenta cinco. Um, <coughs> si vocês quer marca meo endereço na sua not livro, e uh, Silvia, minha secretária, vai mandar copy eletrônico. Não pode mandar papel. Okay, meu cota de sepid não é suficiente. Uh, primero, oh, onde? Oh, here it is. <laughs> well, meu nome é Green. Quando eu cheguei na Brasil, eu pensei em mudar meu nome por Silva <laughs> ou Santos, mas não tinha tempo. So, I'll continue our unique green nose be. Vamos definir cell biology na contexto eu vou discutir. A relação experimental entre organelles e sua função. The relationship between structure and function is a very great theme in all of biology and medicine. Chemists like to look at structure of molecules and their activity, etc., etc. Uh, and this definition, which emphasizes the experimental part, between structure and function, distinguishes cell biology oh, from histology and morphology, which primarily is looking and noting. But here we have a new activity which is attempt, uh, attempting to find the difference between the difference relationship between structure and, and function. So I consider histology and morphology basically descriptive and cell biology experimental. The great input, uh, impulse for cell biology was the development and use of the electron microscope, which happened after World War II, 1945, 1946. And Rockefeller Institute was the center of this uh, development. The Rockefeller Institute was a private research foundation funded by the Rockefeller family, which had an endowment, and they lived off their endowment. There was no grants. And there was a director whose name was Herbert Gasser, who made all the decisions. It was the, un, the most undemocratic organization you can imagine. But it was a meritocracy. That made all the difference. For example, one of the, uh, when the chief, well, there were no departments. Uh, so there's no political space. People didn't have political space to protect. So when the chief of a section or laboratory died or moved away, Gasser would decide whether to close the shop 
or promote or promote and put on uh, the test period the people there. During the time I was there, five people uh, got promoted. Uh, one person, well, two people were Porter and Pallotti. After this man went back to Belgium, uh, another two people were Moore and Stein, who won the Nobel Prize for protein protein uh, sequencing. And the third, uh, the fifth one was uh, uh, Merrifield, who won the Nobel Prize. So Gasser put his money on five people, four of which won the Nobel Prize, and the one who didn't, I think, should have. <laughs> so um, meritocracy can pay off. It was a place where people worked. They obviously was selected very highly. This was not the Rockefeller Foundation. That was an agency that gave away money that also was funded by the Rockefeller. And this was not Rockefeller Center, which was an enormous complex of buildings. This was the Rockefeller Institute and Rockefeller and the Institute later became a university. I think you will be happy to learn that it became a university because when it was 50 years old, its trustees had to make a plan for the next 50 years, and the trustees concluded that it should uh, start as a graduate school, that the place would die if there were no graduate students there. And they started a graduate school in 55, and I was one of the first students. Uh, so I tasted some of the old Rockefeller and participated for seven years. Yes, it took me seven years to do my doctorate. I'll tell you why later. Um, and saw the transition. Uh, it took me seven years because I had worked in Moore and Stein laboratory, protein chemists, sequencing, amino acid analysis, world leaders, and learned a lot about protein chemistry, enzymology, and uh, synthetic peptides, how to make them, how to use, use them. And my thesis was uh, an important subject, uh, it was a, a, how you modify uh, cysteine residues to make them look like lysine and get trypsin cleavage. Because trypsin is our most selective protein. After three years, I picked up a journal and saw my thesis subject resolved better than I would have been doing it, and I just had to stop. There was nothing else to do. Uh, so after three years of this training in protein chemistry, I was floating. I had taken Pilates course in cell biology and was interested in it and saw many ways that protein chemistry can be applied to the course. And after a, a lot of discussions and bargaining and things that I wasn't privy to, it was decided that I would continue my, th start a new thesis with plotting and apply my protein chemistry to a Pilate problem. And at the end of the talk, I'll show <coughs> something of that. Uh, the father of it all was Albert Claude, a Belgian in the United States during the war, who went back to Belgium to help recover, uh, restart science in Belgium. 
you can see here in 1946, and this meant that he had been doing it for many years, he wrote the first paper on differential centrifugation. This is a method after, after you break open the cell, you isolate cell organelles on the basis of their shape, density, and uh, the viscosity of the solution. And uh, 1946 was one year after the end of World War II, about 12 or 13 years before Watson and Crick, and about the same time as um, uh, it was shown that DNA is the genetic material. This is a journal of experimental medicine. is one of the best journals in medical research, and it's a Rockefeller journal. This is important because you'll see the in, in input of the institution. <coughs> Porter was from Canada and worked more in plants, but also in tissue cultures. And he he's my, was my candidate also for the Nobel Prize, but he didn't get it. The committee decided to give it for cell biology, electron microscopy, and the secretory cycle. And Porter was very active in electron microscopy. And he and Pallotti shared a laboratory and were two of Gasser's choices to continue the laboratory of Claude. This is 1945 and just of a tissue culture in the electron microscope. This is Pallotti who is my orientador uh, from Romania. Uh, and in 1948, he described the isolation of mitochondria and uh, some biochemical properties. So these are the first papers of these people in what we now call cell biology. There was a very serious problem of continuity. It's like teaching a, bl a blind man, after he got his vision, the names of things, or what he was looking at. We had a world of light microscopy, of lots of things, lots of organelles, and a new set of images coming from the electron microscope. After you separate the artifacts, you still have a problem, and the artifacts are also a serious problem. How do you recognize artifacts of electron microscopy, which are based on problems of uh, uh, fixation etc. Well, this was not such a problem because these people were mature scientists in their 40s who were well trained in cytology, pathology, because that was all it was at the time. There was no cell biology. Uh, there were other things that you will see that added to the imp uh, fact that these people were shabby or were important in reducing the confusion. Because there was confusion, but it could have been much worse. Uh, just an idea of the words you now take for, for granted which for the new microscope were seen sometimes for the first time, or a hint of them in the light microscope. 
the endoplasmic reticulum had been described in the light microscope, but as a semi-crystalline small body. Later, I'll show you pictures uh, of that structure of fibroblasts, Mur uh, virus of murine carcinoma. In the f late 40s and 50s, uh, the question now of uh, cancer being caused by a virus and or a genetic modification was a very hot subject. And with the electron microscope, they could find and see viruses for the first time, instead of using a dynamic cell extract experiment, they actually saw virus. And uh, there had been a tradition of virology in the Rockefeller Institute because Rouse discovered his famous sarcoma, which is a viral cancer, at the Rockefeller. So at the beginning of the microscopy, included uh, causative uh, causes of cancer. He described the endoplasmic reticulum in 52, uh, and in 53 invented the microtome, which would give them sections thin enough to be able to take advantage of the resolution of the electron microscope. Uh, you wouldn't want to put a piece of <coughs> picanha in the microscope. And you had to get down to micron and less than micron sizes. And they uh, didn't invent but uh, made it possible to use diamond knives. Now a good electron microscope uses a port of bloom or a variation of it and diamond knives. He described trypanosomes, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the endoplasmic reticulum of muscle. And you can see this must have been a very exciting time. Uh, again, like a blind man seeing for the first time. When developing new areas, and this is an important part, the improvement of existing methods or invention of new methods is necessary. This is fundamental because the alternative is you doing the same experiments everybody else is doing and competing with them in a very sort of closed circle. Professor Elio Lorenzo recognized this, and we have in the medical school a uh, machine shop, I think it's now the campus, uh, which I think was a copy of Rockefeller and was designed to uh, uh, facilitate the transfer from laboratory to the commercial uh, scale, uh, the inventions of instruments by scientists. And you can imagine if you invent a new, you invent the Porter Bloom microtome, you can get sections <laughs> that are understandable and thin enough to give you information. We can't all spend all of our time inventing new methods and improving our other methods. But we have to know what is limiting what we are doing and in some situations invest the time and the money to uh, improve or to invent a new method. And this is an outstanding feature of the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, for example, 
uh, the fraction collector that we we used to use. I think it went around and collected effluent from columns uh, in tube. Was invented by Moore and Stein at the Rockefeller Institute because they needed a way of collect collecting effluent from um, columns, separate amino acids. Merrifield, who synthesized the first protein, ribonuclease, um, invented a machine with a man named John Stewart, who, uh, which did all of these steps uh, automatically. You had about, uh, I don't know, five or six steps per residue, but you would had, in ribonuclease, 128 residue. So the 700 or so steps had to be automated. Pilate isolated mitochondria in 1948, as I said, uh, but it took him four years to de describe the fine structure of mitochondria. Now, it wasn't that he was slow or lazy, but when he did describe it in 52, that was the classical description. These people were not in a rush. They were not competing. They had their own rate, and they worked hard. Uh, the first electron microscopes were very unstable, and I remember working with him at 9 o'clock at night because he did all of his microscopy between 9 and 11 at night when the current was more stable, the vibrations in New York were uh, reduced. And um, probably if Rockefeller had been in another state or another city, they couldn't have used the microscope in that day. Because New York City is on a big rock. It's, uh, so they had to work at night. Uh, and he came in at 9 in the morning. Uh, osmium tetroxide vapor. Uh, obviously, for any of you who have done histology, uh, the fixation is the most cr critical part. If you don't fix well, you're looking at it, artifacts or nonsense. Uh, he described ribosomes. There was a man at Rockefeller who didn't believe in ribosomes and was competing with Pilate. He was a, a nucleus man and he was competing with Pilate and he always insisted on calling them Pilate particles so that um, when it turned out to be an artifact, he, uh, he would have the last laugh. Pilate won. <laughs> they are Pilate's particle. Uh, synapses. Uh, microsomes are fragments of the endoplasmic reticulum. This is, in a sense, an artifact of homogenization. You make microsomes, from the endoplasmic reticulum. I show you some endoplasmic reticulum. But um, the most important point is that Pilate didn't was also interested in um, um, capillaries and things like that. He did also into classical questions of structure. But he was fascinated by the pancreatic secretory cycle. And he started looking at the cell and doing experiments to uh, do, uh, determine relationships between structure of the cell and function. And eventually, uh, he mapped that out. Next, oh no. 
Well, with an area like cell biology or an area like electron microscopy, where there's a high probability of having artifacts, uh, these same people invested energy, political energy, in uh, creating a uh, journal. And the journal that they took was <coughs> Journal of Biochemical and the Biophysical Cytology. There's an error there. It was created in 54. It was a journal of the Rockefeller Press. And it was easy for them to take over. Uh, the editing of the journal, this is not simply ed ed a journal, house journal for them to publish their stuff. It was a journal where they could demand quality of fixation, pictures, pictures had to be in focus, for example, which was not always the case of things that were submitted. But they had to increase, had to establish high publication standards. And this is one of the reasons cell biology started and started so well, because Competent people controlled publication. They also started a society, created the American Society for Cell Biology. Their first Congress had 700 participants and 230 uh, papers. I was there. 1960 is 14 years after the first paper of uh, um, Claude on cell fractionation. Well, this thing that was absolutely uh, explosive, I think, because there was a, a need for it. Uh, I imagine, but cannot say, that the cytologists and pathologists that some of the cytologists and pathologists wanted to get beyond description. Biochemistry at that time was doing other things. It was isolating compounds, isolating enzymes, and characterizing enzyme activities. So they couldn't go to biochemistry, but there was a natural affinity be between cell biology and uh, biochemistry. Uh, one of the editors of the uh, journal was Leninger, the famous biochemistry book. He was a mitochondria man. Uh, and Schmidt and Bennett were cytologists, very good cytologists, uh, who recognized the importance of looking at, um, of doing cell biology. Structure function relationship. And they created a society of cell biology. So it was a small group of people that were created by their research and by their politics cell biology. Uh, the journal is terribly important. Uh, a journal establishes standards for carrying out research and reporting research. As an editor, obviously, this would be important to me. Uh, in this case, the quality of the images, the ability to recognize artifacts during the peer review process. Uh, if you have a nice artifact and publish it, everybody <laughs> will think it, it's real. The relationship between structure defined by light and electron microscopy, and eventually the relationship between organelle structure and function. 
Uh, this is about the society. They changed the name of the uh, journal, a journal of biochemical and, and biophysical cytology, to the Journal of Cell Biology. This is 63. Uh, and in 1990, the journal, uh, they created another journal, the Molecular Cell Biology. Both of these journals had very high impact factors. I want to remind you that impact factors were invented to, to evaluate journals. And this is what it was invented for. The number of citations a journal gets per paper published is a measure of the quality of the journal. So I'm using impact factor in its correct sense. Uh, I'm going to give you the pancreatic cycle in words, and I'll later next I'll show you uh, how Pilate and his group um, did it. And uh, so the electron, the gain, the gains in electron microscopy, which the group at Rockefeller were completely open about. Uh, they never tried to keep their methods secret. And since everybody from Europe passed at Rockefeller, uh, it was dispersed. Rapid, uh, rapidly. And this is probably why uh, this explosion, ex uh, explosion uh, of cell biology is it wasn't controlled. Well, the first thing that happens, I'll give you the answer to the question. These are the steps. And next we'll show you how it, they got them. On ribosomes, adhering to the endoprasmic reticulum, synthesis occurs. Then the proteins are sent, transferred to the cisternae of the endoplasmic reticulum. They are then transferred to the Golgi, where they are concentrated in Golgi vacuoles and stored as zymogen and granule. And they are released by fusion of the granule membrane with the apical plasma membrane. That's the story. Now I'll show you the experiments that were done in the 40s and 50s, mostly 50s. Um, yes. Uh, the early methods of electron microscopy were democratized, open to the world, easy, open access. And all the people had to do was buy an electron microscope and a port of loom. Uh, instrument. Uh, this is the first that I found of a differential centrifugation. This is uh, basically differential, differential centrifugation is you take a a uh, dispersion of organelles after you break the cell, spin it for a f specific time at a s specific speed or number of uh, gravity, and you get a new pellet, you get a pellet and a certain Then you resuspend the pellet and do it again, and you get another supernate, etc. So it's very simple. In 46, they already had the word microsomes, but they didn't know where they came from, or they didn't even ask, I think. Uh, and this is the basis of uh, differential centrifugation. If you start playing with the solvent and use sucrose or gradients of sucrose, you can improve or not the method. But this is the basic way of getting things out. This is a beautiful endoplasmic reticulum. 
On the lower right, there's a nucleus and a nuclear membrane. On the left are mitochondria. The membrane is full of Pilati particle, those little dots, and the inside is uh, the cisterna, where proteins get full. So this is a cross-section of a collection of a pile of uh, sheets of the endoplasmic reticulum. Bonita, no? These are all Pilati pictures. I couldn't, he wouldn't publish my pictures. So I had trouble finding focus. It's not easy to focus an electron microscope. Because there's a plate, a photographic plate. And if you get everything perfectly in focus on the plate, it'll come out bad. So you have to know how far from focus to go to get a good result, <coughs> a plate that you can project. Uh, this is the pancreatic acinar cell. Why pancreatic acinar? Uh, why guinea pig? Pancreatic acinar because the pancreas is a a very homogeneous tissue. It has islets, it has connecting ducts, but most of the pancreas is acinar cells that are chock full of zymogen granule. And Pilate picked it so he could start with a homogeneous or quite homogeneous material and not have to purify. This is something we tend to forget. Uh, and what makes working with cancer cells rego complicado, complicated. Uh, these are the Pilate particles. On the outside of the reticulum membrane, so the light part is the inside, the lighter part. And the darker are the, these dots, which are all ribosomes. This is a 50,000 uh, magnification. Uh, you can do better, but this is all Pilate wanted for this. Um, this is the uh, reticulum membrane without the microts without the Pilate particle. Uh, this is the cytoplasmic matrix. Yeah, this white part is what we call the cytoplasm. It's not a big bowl, a big bag of soup. It's very well segregated. And, and here are the attached ribosomes. Uh, this is a, a acinar cell. The granule, you can see just a bit of one up here. The bottom part is the endoplasmic reticulum. He, uh, uh, attached or adjacent to the Golgi complex, which is membranes without particle. And these bigger things are Golgi cisterna. Uh, T. Uh, these are transitional elements where one part of it has uh, particles and the other part is smooth. And that's how the... So the Golgi is a continuation of the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this is a cell differential cell fractionation, typical one of Sikovitz and Pilate in 58. Um, 
the fractions, nuclear, zymogen, mitochondrial, etc. Uh, the first two columns are essentially yield. Most of the protein nitrogen is recovered in the supernitin. That makes sense because that's what the cyt uh, cytoplasm would be. But if you're looking for RNA recovery, it's in the microsomal fraction, which we le learn is derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. And the RNA plus uh, related to protein is also the microsome because that's the, that's the definition of a microsome. It's got protein and RNA. Here we're looking at proteolytic activity. What we're looking at is the product of the hastener cell, proteolytic enzymes. Uh, first, if we compare this column with this, that from little activity to a lot of activity, we get by treating with trypsin. In other words, most of the enzyme is inactive in the cell, but we can activate it with trypsin and go from six to 750 <coughs> units. So this shows that the acinar cell has trypsin activatable proteolytic activity. However, we don't know what the enzymes are. We don't, we can't, identify the enzymes because this was the a very well used assay of the time but trypsin releasable proteolytic activity was all of the uh, activity that released tryptophan and tyrosine. At that time biochemists were playing well even earlier in the 40s were playing with substrates for each of the enzymes. But they didn't use them here, they used a more general assay. What we see is most of the activity, 36, but certainly not all of it, is uh, in the zymogen fraction. And it has uh, the highest ratio of proteolytic activity to total protein. So this shows uh, using numbers, but not quantitative, that uh, the zymogen fraction is important in proteolytic activity, trypsin activator which is what we want to keep our eye on. Oh my. Uh, this is a tissue homogenate showing the mitochondria and uh, mitochondria cell debris uh, membranes and this is the pilates sequence zymogen fraction, which is enriched, but certainly not a homogeneous fraction. Um, another way of looking at this uh, is uh, using a tridiated leucine uh, to label new, newly synthesized protein. The blue is microsome, which remember are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum, and the red is zymogen granule. The other lines, medium, post of microsomal suplinate and homogenate, are essentially constant. So what we see here is that the, the radioactivity in a three-minute pulse starts high in the uh, 
microsomes, then goes down and up in the diamond and granule. So we're the first step. The microsomes are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. So we have um, micro, uh, endoplasmic reticulum and then zymogen gradual. And the same thing is here using a longer three hour incubation period. Now this is very quantitative, but is not specific in the sense we don't know what proteins are being formed. We assume that these are secretory proteins because there's a large turnover of secretory proteins. This is 1967. So differential centrifugation suggests that protein synthesis occurred in the microsomes and uh, however the cell disruption and differential centrifugation have some intrinsic limitations of which they were well aware but it was the best they could do. Um, incomplete separation, translocation, breaking open a diamond and granule protein going to another uh, organelle, non-quantitative control methods. Every time you attempted to increase the homogeneity, you got a large loss of material. Uh, and the obvious conclusion that you need different kinds of evidence to complete the story. This is what now what we call validation. Same thing. I put suggest in the uh, title in parentheses because I made a series of, I do this for my students, uh, indicate is stronger than provide evidence, which is stronger than suggest. Ulrike, you've seen that. Indicate is stronger than provide evidence, which is stronger than suggest. When we write papers, we have to know which word to use. And we can't get out of it by saying may indicate, which is a soft word and a hard word. You divide by two. That doesn't work. Uh, and this is a very important uh, uh, point. And when I made this title, I said, really, what is, the, what is the right word? Now, all of this is world-leading research. But it only comes to suggest. <coughs> but stimulated them to continue. Another thing with the radioactivity is that it was a three-minute... Uh, pulse. You can't get a three-minute pulse on a whole animal. They worked for probably about a year getting a slice system working. The pancreas is, is difficult because it has all this ribonuclease in it. In fact, at that time, nobody had a cell-free system. I don't know if anybody has done that now. Of cell-free protein synthesis of the pancreas. It's not difficult to do with the liver. With the pancreas, it's a mess. So um, this is where they were. And it was hot stuff, beautiful thing, which nobody had ever done, asked these questions, and answered them uh, well. So the answer, so they then invested six years in electron microscopy, autoradiography auto of the cycle. Autoradiography is straightforward in the light microscope. I think because you can't see all the problems. In the electron microscope, it's a disaster. It's very difficult. And you see very little of it now. 
Uh, uh, this is the endoplasmic reticulum with these splotches, which are tritiated leucine or uh, decomposition. You see, there's nothing in the nucleus, nothing in near the nucleus, and nothing in the zymogen granule, but just in the endoplasm reticulum. So this is a another method showing that confirming, extending the microsomes being the first fraction that picks up the radioactivity. And here we see it in a whole cell. Uh, this is uh, 37 minutes. And these things that look like cho uh, chocolate chip cookies are really zymogen gradients pre in the vac in the in the early stage with uh, radioactive decay. I don't know. So in there is a lot of membranes that are without particles, and they are the Golgi. So these uh, collecting vacuole in the Golgi has picked up the radioactive activity of uh, some of the radioactivity that is in the continues in the endoplasmic reticulum. This is four from the same paper. Uh, this is Jim Jameson's doctoral thesis. Uh, this is three minutes after the pulse in the endoplasmic reticulum. Seven minutes after the pulse in the Golgi. 37 minutes, which is what we showed before, chocolate chip cookies. And finally, an acinus, which has a collecting dark in it, and the apical part of several uh, acinus cells, all full of zymogen granules. And I'll show you a discharge picture later. And what will happen is that the granules move through this membrane, which fuses, and the contents coil. This is the autoradiogram data, but the uh, tritiated leucine in the slice, true three-minute pulse, and then cell fractionation. Uh, so this complements the other, except here we're looking at newly synthesized protein. And we see the protein first goes to the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And now we've separated in the counting peripheral vessels and uh, condensing vacuoles, which are the pre pre granule. And uh, we see it goes from peripheral vessel to the condensing vacuole, then to the zymogen granule. And there's a suggestion of it going to the acid or lumen. But since that gets washed out, you don't find much in the lumen. But there's a very nice picture of granules, which are membrane limited things, and uh, fusing, and fusing with the membrane of the acidus, the collecting duct, we have double membranes here, and then an opening of the, of the granule, and the contents going into the duct. Uh, I have to do this quickly. May I have five minutes more? 
but it's already an hour. Uh, my contribution to this story was my doctorate, second doctorate. Uh, these are the granules I isolated, and I, after the discuss in the discussion, I'll tell you why I prepared the best fraction of zymogens in the history of the universe. But you have to ask the question. These are the granules in my preparation, and these are bovine. Yeah, why did I go to bovine? Uh, the tradition, which was started at Rockefeller by uh, Kudis and Nothra, who first crystallized proteins, and then by Bornstein, who sequenced ribonuclease, which had been crystallized by Northrop and Gunas. The whole tradition of protein chemistry was bovine, because bovine was easier to get. You go to the companies, Worthington went to the slaughterhouse, got a couple of kilos of pancreas, and uh, made bovine pan uh, trypsin, bovine chymotrypsin bovine everything. But all the data I've shown you until now is uh, a guinea pig. And all the data I've shown you until now is not name specific. In other words, all the trips in activatable was all just non-described enzyme. So with my experience in protein chemistry, synthetic substrates, my thesis began to uh, ask the question, are the granules the intracellular storage sites? And the idea was to give this answer in specific terms, names. Almost 150 years ago, a German cytologist postulated that they were because they were he took uh, animals the like cows and later Claude Bernard did this with human pancreas uh, and showed that after you stimulated the pancreas all the granules disappear so it was based on a good observation but you know it suggested it didn't demonstrate uh, so these are the granules, which my wife calls my beans, in alkaline pH, solubilizing all the proteins and uh, leaving membranes. This may be the best preparation of Golgi and membranes in the history of the universe. It's analog of uh, red blood cell membranes, which are isolated by way of the granule, not by a membrane separation. Uh, the proteins I looked at, there were 10, are indicated in uh, uh, Negrito. So they're carbo carboxypeptidases, desoxyribonuclease, lipase trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, ribonuclease A and B. These are the ones I uh, did. Uh, then I ran them on, well, this shows a partial fractionation, anionic and cationic. And then I took the cationic, and this is a comparison of the cationic fraction with the, of the granules and juice. First, this big peak at the end with the open circle is ribonucleus activity. So all of the, the two diagrams have a big peak there and then three small peaks here. These small peaks represent uh, glycosylated ribonucleus. 
what we're showing is that the two juice and the granule fraction have ribonuclease activity with the same chromatographic behavior. And they're in the same relative proportion. Since ribonuclease is about 3% of the total protein, this peak, ribonuclease B, is about one-tenth of 1%. One so we're showing identity, molecular identity, because of, or not molecular identity, we're showing chromatographic identity and a very small, low concentrated component. We did the same thing with uh, zymogen granules and juice with trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen. They eluded in the same place. This little peak is some soybean trypsin inhibitor added to prevent activation. If you look at the abs abscissa, you see that both of these diagrams are normalized to the same extent. That means the specific activity, since the two uh, lines, open and closed circles, are about the, are the same, that these two have the same chromatographic uh, act, uh, the same chromatographic uh, properties. Synthetic substrates were used. So this peak is chymotrypsin and distinguished from the other uh, fraction, which is trypsidin. And the specific activity used to normalize this was the same as some of the best reported in the literature, which means there was no other protein contaminating this part of the chromatogram. We accounted for about 81% of the protein, and we got compositions that were the same within the experimental era uh, in the granule and um, juice. Okay? Four, ten specific enzymes quantitatively. And this is the last step. Oh. This is general, as indicated by the thesis of Alan Tartikoff, uh, in the guinea pig as well. I mean, we expected it to be. Uh, these are, this is the pancreatic granule content, and this is the uh, secretory product, and these are the individual enzymes. So it's a general phenomenon. Two. So this is the uh, the story showing in words and in pictures of the protein synthesized synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, released into the cisternae. That was done by a man named Gunther Blobel, who was also a postdoc of uh, Pilate and Sabatini, and that's where the end peptide is cut off during the transfer into the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, Blobel won the Nobel Prize for that, too. Uh, 
So it goes into the endoplasmic reticulum, which then goes into the cisternae of the Golgi, which fills them, condenses, and we get a membrane-limited granule, which fuses with the endoplasm with the uh, collecting duct membrane and shoots the contents out. So this is a kind of secretion where the cell is intact. I've forgotten the other one, but mammary secretion, the cell gets destroyed. You couldn't let this happen by destroying the cells because the pancreas would eat itself up because you have all these zymogens or you'd get pancreatitis. This is a picture of George Pilate. Uh, when Donna Electra came to the United States and met Pilate, she told me she could only imagine him on a white horse. <laughs> Uh, he was a gentleman and a scholar and uh, always available, worked very hard, 12 hours a day, because he could only do his microscopy at night. His other interest was history, ancient history. And uh, World War II, he served in the Romanian Army Medical Corps. Came to the States right after the war. Protein Chemistry Lab is a, a part of the Hemo Center, CEPID, et cetera, et cetera. That's our door. <coughs> Come and visit. And I should say that this talk was prepared about 12 years ago, 14 years ago, by Lyris and Gustavo helping me prepare my concourse for Titularm. And uh, since then, it's been changed a bit. 